Hi, I'm Jeremy Corbyn. I'm doing something a bit unusual today. Over the last few years, I've been asked lots of questions. Tonight, I'm asking the questions. I'm asking the questions of my very good friend, Roger McKenzie. Roger is running to be General Secretary of my union, Unison. I'm a member of Unison and very proud to be a member of Unison. And I'm supporting Roger because I've known him for many, many, many years. We campaigned together in this community around here where I live and work and represent. We've knocked on doors together. We've listened to people's tragedies and grievances together. And we've shared the good times and the bad times together. And then Roger has become a union organiser in the West Midlands with the regional TUC and then as a national officer of Unison and now he's running to be General Secretary. And I think Roger is so well qualified for that job because of his life experience, because he's a black man standing up in what is frankly a pretty racist world. And Roger has always stood up to defeat the scourge of racism within our society and stood for justice. And so it's my absolute pleasure tonight to spend a bit of time putting your questions to Roger, but the first one is solely from me. Roger, welcome. Tell us in a few words what you will bring to the job of General Secretary of Britain's biggest union. I think, well, first of all, Jeremy, thank you for those really kind words um, and for, for all the other comrades who've um, supported me, Diane, John Trickett, um, Dawn Butler, um, Kate Osmore, I could name a whole list of them, um, but it really, it really is important to me that my friends and comrades um, stand by me. And what I'm going to try and bring um, to this job is what I always try and bring um, to my union work, to my politics, is um, honesty and passion. Um, I think that um, we we have a real opportunity here to highlight what is actually going on at the moment, where many people in our communities um, are being put in harm's way by this government uh, who are you know, just in danger you know just wondering um, what is going to happen to them many of our um, many of our colleagues many of our friends many of our neighbors um, are worried this week about what's happening to their homes whether they're going to be evicted um, what's happening to their jobs is it safe to go into work um, and we have to be their voice um, when they can't make where, where they can't be their own voice, we have to do it for them, and that's what we've always done. Um, I remember going around um, places like the Andover Estate with you, um, just around the corner from where I used to live, and you know, just listening to what people have to say, not assuming that we know everything, um, listening to what people have to say, and um, believing um, their stories, and helping them to organise. To make things better and for me that's that's what i am jeremy i mean you've known this we've known each other for more than 30 years it's 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 organizing to make things better for our class and that that's what i want to do um but i i hope i bring that that honesty and a real passion for social justice um uncompromising in that search for social justice um, because I think, if, frankly, if you didn't have trade unions today, you'd have to invent them because of the, the sort of things that are facing working people at the moment. Roger, where I am at the moment is about um, 300 metres away from your former home at 57 Burnham Road. You see, I remember the number. I went, I went there often. I went there often enough. I ought to be able to. And uh, we're just right next to the Andover Estate here. Now, being General Secretary of the Union is obviously a huge honour and a huge responsibility. And Unison represents members in local government, in health, in universities, in water, and in many, many different sectors. And what I'd like to do is hear from you in, in a few words how you represent those sectors, because these are the questions we're getting coming in. So let's deal with, the, with local government first. Uh, local government has shown itself to be so important during the corona crisis, but also shown itself to be under-resourced. And it's only got through, like health, because of the work of so many wonderful volunteers. So the first question is, how would you seek to improve the lot of local government members of Unison? 
Well, for, for, for me, it starts from a position of this isn't something that comes down from high. Um, what workers gather together in their trade unions in solidarity with each other to, to build power in their workplaces. Um, so we, we can sloganize around all this stuff forever, but, but actually what really makes a difference is workers organizing. Now, the, the, the bottom line issue for us and what I've been talking about all the way through this campaign is that we simply don't have enough people participating in the union. Um, and you look at some of our areas around local governance and some of our branches, um, our density levels, so the number of people that we've got um, in membership as compared to how many people are working in those places, is, ju is just too small to make a difference. So what I'm talking about is building real power for, for members in the workplace, making sure that we get the resources to our members so that they can make a difference. Now, I mean, there's big issues around that. There's been talked about around the union for, for many years about making sure we have more resources. What I'm talking about is all of the resources of the union going to support organising. And if, if, if there's people across the union who are not participating or not supporting organising, then I'm going to ask the question, why is that? Because organising gives us that, the ability, as you know, Jeremy, from your past experience as a full-time officer for that great union, National Union of Public Employees. If, if, you, don't, if you don't have members in the workplace, um, if the more members you have in the workplace, the more strength you have, the more organisation you have in the workplace, then the stronger your hand is when you're going to bargain with the employer or with governments, and the stronger your hand is to be able to um, have a political voice, and the stronger your um, arm is to for your campaigning agenda as well. So everything starts from organizing everything starts from building that power within the workplace having many many more activists and i think it's particularly important jeremy around local governments because um it's so badly funded so underfunded and 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 it's not like all those years ago in the early 80s when you had um you know uh, our branches had one employer um, to deal with, which was the main employer. Many of our branches now have 200, 300, sometimes 400 um, employers that they do, they have to deal with from one local government branch. Yeah. And, and we, we have to do something about that because we're not even recognised as a, as a trade for, for, for bargaining purposes with most of those employers. Yeah. So the only way we make a difference is build power so that we can get recognition with the private sector parts of the membership but we have power with the core membership but frankly the private sector membership we need to bring back in-house anyway we need to end the scourge of privatization indeed in my time as an organizer with new it never felt it at the time but it was actually relatively straightforward in that the vast majority of our members were employed either by the nhs or by local government and um our job was to recruit where they were not members but also it was fairly straightforward on representation and now I go to unison branch meetings and you're talking, as you say, of dozens of different employers working in the care sector or somewhere else. Now, obviously, the way the solution is to bring them back into public uh, service. But in the meantime, we have to get and keep recognition in those companies in order to make sure they get similar conditions to those working in local government. Now, I've had a lot of questions in and one of them is this, really. Um, 40% of the people that responded to the survey wanted a pledge on NHS pay and workload. Now, I think the NHS workload is enormous and people have seen the value of the NHS during the corona crisis and uh, I take my hat off to them, but they've survived by the, the way in which they've worked. But the pay levels have not gone up. I mean, I've been out there applauding the NHS workers every Thursday, but I'm also pledging to try and increase their pay. I'm not sure the government was doing the same. No, and, and they, they, they don't seem particularly mm. interested. I mean, you remember the start of the year when um, this government made a, a comment about unskilled, um, they, might, they might as well have just said unworthy, um, people delivering um, public services because that's what they actually meant. Um, and then there was a kind of roller coaster that took place where all of a sudden, when the coronavirus hit, 
um, then these workers who were unskilled and unimportant on one level suddenly became the most important people in the country because they were keeping people alive and keeping, you know, keeping people sane, basically. Um, and then after things eased off a little bit, then the, the narrative started to change again from the government. And we, we can't allow people to be treated like that. But, you know, one of the things about the NHS, um, I, I think this is a really good example. And, you know, I, I mean, I'll talk about some of the specific pledges in a minute. But for me, we have a situation where there, there is, you know, what we were talking about before in terms of so many private sector companies, big transnational corporations involved in delivering NHS services, basically. And what we find with many of those companies is that they're outside of the pay arrangements. Yeah. Um, for the public sector, for the people employed directly by NHS trusts and stuff. So what we need to do is we need to do much more to, to get those workers on exactly the same terms and conditions as, as the NHS trust workers. Obviously, again, this is something where the priority is obviously to bring them in-house and have them um, directly employed by the trust. But while they're not, we still need to make sure that they get the same um, settlements as everybody else. Because I say we, we did um, some organising up in um, St Helens and Knowsley um, over the last few years, me and my organising team. And we were doing some work up there with some people who work for Compass, who were delivering, you know, I mean, services across that hospital. Um, they, they were not getting the same um, agenda for change terms and conditions of everybody else but we helped to organize them we, we did a lot of work with them built their stewards base gave them some confidence that they could actually succeed they ended up winning a 17 percent pay increase because of their own efforts but frankly they shouldn't be in that situation um, so so many workers in the nhs have fallen so far behind what i'm saying jeremy is this I, I absolutely support what Unison's doing in terms of um, saying there should be a £2,000 immediate um, pay increase given to all NHS workers. Um, and I hope that's what is being said. I think it is that it's all NHS workers, including public and private sector. Um, and I think that's fine. But people have fallen so far behind over the years. Um, I think the estimate is it's something like 20%. Um, behind so that we, we need to do something to redress that balance now we can sloganize about all that all we like but what will make the difference is organizing on the ground we have to give people the power and the resources to be able to build strong union organization on the ground so that we can win those um, improved pay because this government ain't about to give anybody um, any kind of money unless they unless they're forced to do it and that's my point now, Roger, there's a very, very serious crisis happening in the country at the moment. We all know that, the uh, COVID-19 crisis. And it's affected all of our members of Unison, in particular those on the front line in the NHS and the front line in local government care workers and so on. There's been failures of PPE, there's been failures of testing, and the responsibility too often is thrown back at people who's not responsible for it, but have to deal with the concerns of the community as a whole. How would you approach the support needed for our members during the corona crisis? Well, I, I, I think there's a few things that we need to do. Firstly, um, we do need to continue the work that's already started within Unison about making sure that we have enough health and safety reps on the ground um, to do the risk assessments that are absolutely necessary for people just to go back into workplaces, but also for people already in workplaces to make sure that that their health and safety is paramount. Um, I'm, I'm really, I mean, one of the things that we've seen is the massive impact on the black community um, of um, the, the virus. I, I'm really concerned as a black person myself about just walking outside, um, about going on public transport, um, about going into any kind of public space. Uh, I'm scared about it. So I'm absolutely convinced that so are lots of other people as well. So there's immediate things that, that we can do that's going to help the situation around um, um, risk assessments and so on. But there's other things that we can do because this isn't going away um, anytime soon. I think one of the pledges that, that um, I'm really happy to support is that we, we set up a, a task force 
um, from the within the union um, to deal with the ongoing crisis um, around the pandemic that is still with us. Um, we, we don't know how long this thing's going to last, but you know the estimates that I'm hearing at the minute is it's going going well into next year, well into next year. So we we need a a short term approach to it. We need a medium term approach, but we also need a long term approach. One more thing I, I would add, Jeremy, and, and I'm sure you've had this at your surgeries, is the mental health impact of all of this as well. Um, and I, we're hearing from not just our members who are um, experiencing real difficulties about this, but our, our reps as well. We need to make sure as a union um, that we that we make, that we have um, support in place for our um, reps, for our shop stewards who are dealing with things that they've never probably had to deal with before. Talking with members about bereavement, um, that might be some of our members in the health service might have had to deal with that, but so many of our reps and have never had to deal with that stuff before. And we have to make sure that they're safe and that they're protected, um, both physical terms, but also their mental health as well. I think it's also a lesson for the whole community here that uh, grades of workers that uh, the media make jokes about and look down upon, like cleaners, yeah. like porters, like people that are sweeping our streets, they're absolutely vital at a time like this in a way that they haven't been properly respected in the past. But can I ask you about a couple of Can I just say on that, Jeremy? Because one, one of the things that um, always comes to my mind, my, my mum was a cleaner. Um, and um, I, I, I always remember, um, I mean, she used to do two jobs just to survive, and, you know, keep us in, in one piece, basically. And um, so we were brought up in, in Walsall in the black country. Um, West Midlands, your fellow West Midlander, as I, as I, as I remember. Um, yeah, from the same region as... Absolutely, well. absolutely. I remember mum used to clean at the town hall and then go over the road to clean at the then health authority. And we used to have to go and meet her, um, me or my brother, um, because she was continually getting attacked um, by racists um, after her shift. And if you think about autumn, winter evenings, when it was, you know, it was getting darker and darker, she really didn't want to, to walk or catch the bus. You know, she still had to walk to catch the bus or walk home. And um, so we used to come, had to come and meet her. So I, I remember really clearly um, having to stand in front of my mom while people were giving her abuse and me abuse and they're trying to attack her. Um, and all she was doing was what the cleaners that you refer to are doing. They're trying to do a job, trying to make a living, trying to keep their families together, clothed and fed and warm. Um, and we've got, we've got to, we've got to be the ones. And this for me was always the his, historic mission of the trade union movement, but also the Labour Party. We have to be the people who are telling the truth about what's happening to our people, whether it's racist attacks, whether it's domestic violence, or whether it's just what happens every single day with bullying in workplaces and stuff, and how people think that they can treat our people because of the jobs that they do. They don't give any worth to cleaners or um, dinner ladies or whatever, and they think that they can just treat them badly and it's unacceptable and that has to be always at the front of our minds i think that that is our job to stand up for working class people roger you've always been absolutely brilliant campaigning against racism and i've heard you make the most passionate speeches often to largely white audiences about what it's like to be a black worker in a school in a hospital or, or wherever else um, as general secretary of unison you'd be in a very powerful position to speak out about the divisions that racism creates in our society. What sort of stuff would you bring to the union for that? Yeah, yeah absolutely. I mean, I think it really is important um, that the voice of the, um, the general secretary is really clear about racism. I'll, I'll, I'll give credit to, to Dave Prentice. He's always been, a, 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 you know, an absolute um, you know, supporter of anti, the anti-racist cause and has really supported my work um, within this. Um, and he's, he's been great ar around that. So the voice of the general secretary is really important, but so is the voice of everybody else. 
you know, if you've got 1.3 million members as we've got, then the ambition for me would be that we turn everybody into an anti-racist within that organization. And so what, what you're saying, Jeremy, about um, education courses, um, education programs for our members and for our activists, I think is absolutely vital because everybody has to be talking about, it. we cannot say that we're, um, we're, we're in favor, we're, we're a union for social justice. Um, unless everybody's talking about it. it, can't be just Roger McKenzie's for social justice or one or two others are for social justice. Is that we have to not just proclaim it, but then we have to go and organize and campaign and bargain for it as well. And to be able to do any of those things, you've got to have training all the way through every level for our activists, but also importantly for all of our staff, regardless. And if I'm general secretary, I would expect to be um, on regular um, courses as well. Um, so that my knowledge was updated because I'm never going to say that I understand it all. What I have is a personal experience and a level of understanding. But things, as, as you know, Jeremy, you know, I mean, you're one of the, you know, the, 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 the most anti-racist campaigners that I've ever met in my life, which is one of the reasons we get on so well. And, and, one, and one of the reasons for that is because you don't just talk about it. You actually do it. I remember, um, you know, the stories of you and Bernie down in Haringey, you know, not just talking about the fact that the fascists were, were coming to march through Wood Green, but you there with Bernie and importantly, thousands of other people as well standing up against these people. And that's what we have to do. So it's, it's standing up against the racists and the fascists um, when they try and march through our communities. But it's also bargaining in the workplace as well. That's what we have to do. There's also the issue of discrimination at the workplace because um, standing up to overt racism on the street, we do and will always do, but there's also the loneliness of being discriminated against at the workplace, not knowing where to go, not knowing how to deal with it and actually ended up not achieving what you could in your workplace because of that discrimination. Do you feel that the union could do more than that and would you want to do more on that yeah yeah absolutely and and, and there's some very practical difficulties with that, that we really can't underestimate the fact is we, we've got thousands of workplaces where we've got one or two members in these workplaces um, they're often really spread out um, and in a lot of these workplaces we don't have recognition within those workplaces and often really hostile employers, never mind supervisors, which is the level, as you, as you know, Jeremy, where most of the difficulties um, come from. So this is where what I'm talking about in terms of building strong organization where no member of Unison is left behind because you might be in a small workplace, because you might be in a particular part of the country, um, you might be in a particular nation or region, or you might be in a particular occupation, we have to make sure that everybody who is a member of Unison has an absolute understanding that if you mess with one of us, then you are messing with all of us and that the full weight of our organisation will come in behind that member. And that is a really, really important statement to make. It's a really important statement to make because, because we have to make that a reality. And the only way we make it reality goes back to the point that you made before, Jeremy, about that training and making sure that the ethos of the organisation is clear to everybody, but that we train everybody to be able to deliver the things that we're talking about. But the leadership of the whole thing is, is critical. It's absolutely critical. There's a number of very interesting questions popping up on the screen. I don't know if you're seeing them, but um, as you know, we have members obviously in local government and health and in the private sector, which unfortunately runs some of those services. But we also have members in uh, universities and uh, further and higher education in general, and also in the water industry. Now, in the case of the water industry, it's almost entirely privatized. And so sometimes those struggles are different, sometimes even more, di or even more difficult. And so could you say a little bit about your attitude towards the university sector and its multiplicity of employers, as well as the water industry? I, th I think uh, starting with um, higher education, 
Well, actually, let's go beyond that first. Let's start with further education because further education for me, that that was one of the areas that gave me an opportunity when I failed at school um, to, to go through FE and also taught in FE for a while as well when I taught as a, um, a trade union education tutor in um, at Tottenham College. Um, and one, one of the things that um, is clear to me is that the Tories have completely you know, decimated further education and they're trying to do the same to higher education. When you are so reliant in higher education on um, the, the money that foreign students bring in, then, and, and then, then that comes to a halt, basically, with COVID-19. Um, and then you have a, a, a problem then in terms of real funding for people. I think that one of the difficulties around HE is that we have to speak up for the um, for university staff, all university staff, not just the lecturers, as important as they are in the process, but the whole university team who are there to deliver uh, an, an educational experience for our members. So one of the things that's most important to me about higher education is that we speak up for the sector. Um, one of the things through all the hustings that, that, that I've done, I've lost count of how many um, I've done, um, but one of the things that I've heard all the time is that the smaller sectors of Unison always feel as though they're you know, second class citizens within Unison um, to high, to, in relation to local government and the health service. Well, we can't allow that to happen. We have to, we have to give um, voice to those sectors, not just me doing it as a general secretary or senior officials doing it, but create the space for the workers within those sectors to also be able to talk about what's actually happening to them um, on a daily basis. And I think the same is, is true for, um, for water um, and around energy um, as well. Um, we, we can't allow people to feel left behind. So part of what we need to do, Jeremy, I think, is make sure that they have the resources to be able to do what they need to do, that we provide the space for them to do what they need to do. So what does that mean? Well, it's more, it's more than just about making sure there's more money to do things within those branches, but it's making sure that they get more support from the regions and more support from the national to be able to deal with the issues that they're facing. We are, we're going to have some real difficulties around HE in particular. Um, over the next few years. Um, it's a sector that is struggling to survive. I don't know if I, I ever told you this, Jeremy, but up until recently, um, Kate was working. Um, for those who don't know, Kate's my, my wife, Kate McKenzie. She's, um, she was uh, working at a university in Bath, um, Bath Spa, for a while, um, as, a, as a Dean of Education. And, she, and the, the university is in, in real difficulty. She left that and she's working elsewhere now. I mean, local government again. But the experience that I'm hearing all the time, my friend Katie Hall, who works at um, University of uh, Cardiff, um, was telling me the other day about some of the difficulties that they're facing around the lockdown. Um, what does that mean around the pandemic? What does that mean for university staffs that um, can't do their work online? You know, they're, they're really scared about what's happening to their futures. And we have to be their voice. We have to be the voice of our work, of our members who work in, in the water industry. But these privatised companies are only bothered about making money and not particularly bothered about anything else. Um, and we have to speak up for them um, and make sure that they are able to speak through their trade union and that they should never feel like second class citizens. Never. I, th I think what's been interesting in the last few months, or well, years actually, has been the campaigns in universities to bring cleaning and catering and services like that back in house when there's been a joint campaign of our members in unison with other unions, with those in UCU and the teaching unions as well. And indeed, I was invited to a celebration at SOAS, School of Oriental and African Studies, to celebrate bringing the services back in house because it's been an ongoing campaign and I complimented them on that. And this is real life and happening all over the country. So I think it is important we get that message over to our members. I mean, I think it is, and the reason why they, they managed, well, one of the reasons why I think they managed such a great victory at SOAS, and it really was, um, was they, they, they got one of the highest density 
in higher education for, yeah. for Unison, and it makes a difference. You can you can turn these employers around. You can you can change their plans, but also you can give real power and real confidence to those workers by the power of your numbers. And and for me that you know there's not not too much I don't think within the trade union movement that can't be solved by really strong union organisation. Jeremy, what I'm saying is I think there should be 100,000 people active within our union, 100,000, and out of 1.3 million members, that covers 150,000 plus workplaces. If you have 100,000 people who are shop stewards or health and safety reps or putting putting a notice up on a notice board. It makes a difference. It makes a difference. We can build real power for people. Now, the other point I want to put to you, Roger, is that you've covered the main areas of membership of the union and done that extremely well in the discussion we've been having. Being general secretary of a huge union like Unison gives you a lot of other platforms as well. You're on the general council of the TUC. You're a very important part of the TUC. We have members on the national executive of the Labour Party, and we're a big voice on all the other issues that affect our members. And I don't know about you, but I think that unions have to go in the direction of also being much more of a community organisation as well, because our members suffer bad housing, our members suffer insecure housing in the private rented sector, our members suffer all the problems everybody else does in society. And I, do, I don't know about you, but I think the unions need to go in that direction as well, of being more involved in the communities. Couldn't, couldn't agree couldn't agree more i mean i think it's a bit of a distinction really to say that there's um you know you you go to work you do your hours at work and you know that's your person do, doing that um you're, you're a work person and then you kind of switch off as you come out of the building or whatever it is and then you become a regular person you know does other things i, I don't think people look at things in that way i think people look at things as here's me as a person roger mckenzie um, who is a father, a husband, um, you know, a, you know, a football fan, whatever, you know, all of those things run through at the same time. And I think we, this type of trade unionism that I believe in, Jeremy, is much is much more of a kind of um, full kind of view of a person. Um, so we organise in the workplace, but we also organise in communities. And, and also some of those things are not different. So many of our members work in schools. Schools are in communities. You know, the brilliant school up the road um, from where you are now, Montem School, um, where my daughter went. Um, great, great school. I mean, Kate was, uh, was chair of governors there uh, for, for a while. It's a really great school, but it's very much part of the community. Very mm. much part of the community. And I, I, I think that... We, we also have lots of unison members in schools, but we also have lots of unison members who know people who work in schools. We have lots of unison members who've got kids in the schools or no kids in the schools. Yeah, there's, there's no difference. So we have to organise um, for social change as well as change within the workplace. And I think that's where also where the link with um, the Labour Party becomes so, so important as well that we we get back to this notion that the trade union movement and the Labour Party, I know some, there's a whole bunch of people who try and create a difference. I, I, I absolutely reject that difference. I think we are a movement. We are a Labour movement. And that Labour movement needs to be making a difference for all working class people. And if people aren't public service workers and, and able to be members of Unison, I want to be supporting firefighters, you know, the, the, the fire station, which I hope is still down the road on, on Hornsey Road there. You know, I'd want to be supporting them as well. Um, I'd want to be supporting um, people down at the Sabell Centre um, down the road um, as well. You know, some, some of those people um, are not directly Unison members. Some are. But we have to create much more of a notion again, I think, of a labour movement that stands up for working class people wherever you are and whatever you're doing and much more cooperation um, between the trade unions to get that done. So one of my priorities would be in terms of that general council stuff that you mentioned, Jeremy, would be much, much closer cooperation um, between trade unions, not just on industrial issues, as we, we do need to do much more of, but on those community um, issues as well. Um, we, we need to do much more together. 
the united voice of unions on economic strategy and the pressure they can put on the chancellor and indeed on all political parties should never be underestimated because uh, they have to be the voice of the entire community as well and so i want to ask you a couple of other questions before i do roger I, you mentioned you're a football supporter i've been ever so good and ever so diplomatic here i'm drinking out of an arsenal mug but i was trying to put my hand over it so as not to offend you but just so you know it's there and that's it because i know you're a, a villa supporter and um, long may that be the case well you, uh, well uh, there's a you, you remember the story about um uh when when the new stadium um was was being discussed by um by the council by the council when i was still a councillor in islington mm. and um, like everybody in this, we had a special meeting at union chapel and the whole the whole meeting knew that i wasn't um wasn't an arsenal fan and um, so as soon as I got up to speak in the meetings, nobody thought I was going to speak. And I got up to speak in the meeting that was about whether or not we should give um, permission for the new stadium. Um, and I got booed even by my own side. So I, I know that feeling. You get booed before you've even started to speak. Yeah. Not, not a new experience for me, to be honest. And um, so, so I, I just said, no, I, I just want to make it clear that um, I support the new stadium. And I got a round, nice, polite round of applause. I think Ian Wright and all those sorts of people were in the room at the time and all this was going on. And I got a nice, polite round of applause. And I said, because I don't want there to be any excuses when Villa come down here and beat you lot. Right, and then I got booed again. Well, there you are. <laughs> You're not afraid of going into the lion's den, are you? But remember, the first game that we played was, was um, Villa. Indeed. A couple, couple of other points. Um, yeah. You were obviously very well aware of all the issues going on for units and members because you spent years traveling around the country traveling to uh, branch meetings and list and listening to them what would be your big pitch on recruiting young people into into the union because i am concerned that overall union membership is generally not amongst young people. Unison is different. Unison has a majority of women members, has a very large number of black and minority ethnic members, and has a lot of young members. But, as you rightly said, what we call density of membership is very low. In some places, you expect it to be very high. So how would you address that fundamental issue that the trade unions face? Well, I think um, in terms of Unison, we surprisingly um, to many we, we actually do really well at recruiting young members i think something like six years um, on the spin we've broken the record for young member recruitment so recruiting young members is not something we should ever be complacent about but it's 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 not it's not the primary problem the primary problem is involvement in the union because i, I don't hold with this thing that um, it's often said that young members are the future of the union. I think that might be right, but actually they're the present as well within the union. And we have to do much, much more to get them um, to find ways of enabling them to be involved within the union. There are some difficulties on the, on the horizon, though, in terms of that young member recruitment, because many of those young members are, work, are, are coming in at call centres. Um, British Gas is actually the largest employer of young members of, um, members of Unison. Um, and we, we've heard about the difficulties that are going on at British Gas um, at the minute, sacking, sacking um, workers and re-engaging re them on worse terms and conditions. Um, which is outrageous, outrageous use of Tory um, legislation. Um, so there's some difficulties there that we've got to be right on top of. If that's a primary place where young members are coming into, um, into Unison membership, then we have to make sure that they're organised and we're there to, to raise their voices. Um, so I think there's a lot that we have to do um, in terms of dealing with the issues that affect our young members, particularly um, around, I think, issues around housing. You know. There's a, a young woman called Nicola, Nicola Moran, just come up on the screen saying, yes, Roger, we are the present. Thank you. That, that's, that's absolutely right. Um, but the other issue is participation in the union. Being a union member is good. That's a good start. But it's also about participation and that 
obviously includes the possibility of branch meeting attendance and things like that. But in reality, because of the shift patterns of many of our members, there is never a time that you can hold a branch meeting and everybody can get to. Uh, and that is a difficulty. And I've looked at other unions and their ability to communicate through YouTube, through social media, through Facebook and so on. What, how would you try to develop union communications and the voice of union members to the national officials like your good self? I think um, when, when you see that um, my comrades at the NEU managed to have a Zoom meeting of 20,000 people during the COVID crisis, I think, I think it's gone down as the, the largest meeting of trade unionists in well, living memory, probably. Um, that then... You can't ignore the need to to look at the use of the kind of technologies that we've got. And what I'd want to do is to to invest the union in looking at those technologies um, and trying to find ways of utilising them so that people feel well that that they're able to take part in in meetings. But how would you strengthen the voice of members in the direction of the union and the policy making? Because Clearly, uh, democracy is a two-way street. Yeah, um, m one of my biggest concerns, Jeremy, is um, not so what it is about people taking part in, in branch meetings, but it's, it's also we, we have a real problem where you have a situation where yeah, nine, over 90% of people, and, and we're not the only union where this is a problem. Over 90% of people don't take part in elections to um, elect the people who, who are governing the union, um, either people who uh, negotiate their terms and conditions or people on the national executive or even the, the last general secretary election for the general secretary. You know, 90 percent of people not taking part that that isn't participation and that's not a member led union. What I want to see unison is a real genuine member-led union where members are not just we, we don't just throw that out and say yeah we're member-led but but actually members are able to participate now I go back to what i said before about the difficulty of that when many of our members um don't see another colleague so many of our care workers who are going around doing 20 minutes at someone's home um and then getting their instructions on the phone about where to go next um, are spending most of their working day not seeing anybody. They might have somebody working alongside them, but that's about it. And we, we have to create a new idea, I think, about what a collective is um, and how they can show solidarity with other workers um, who maybe do, do the same occupation as them, but who they never see. And that's where some of the technologies are important to be able to just link people together. So one of the things that I know is that when you link people together electronically, you know, at some point people want to meet personally, and I think that's great. And we have to facilitate that as well. Roger, I'm in the North London studios here, but we're covering the whole country, England, Wales, Scotland and Northern Ireland, and we've got a message for all of our members. Have you got a few last words straight to camera you want to say as to how you want people to vote in the general secretary election and what you will bring to the job i i hope that people have some hope one of the things that i learned when i first got into politics was from um the the, the great man um tony ben he I, I always remember him saying talking about the importance of hope but also the importance, I think, as an organiser of turning hope into action. And what I want to do is to give people hope, but turn that hope into real change within our union. Real change that's going to bring about a substantial um, improvement in the balance of power in, that exists within the workplace, where so many employers have decided that they want to, they think it's all right to treat our members um, with disrespect and we have a chance to bring about a real change so I'm asking you not just to vote for me as I hope you will um, to be the next general secretary of Unison but I'm asking you to get involved in the campaign and then get involved in the union so what I'd like people to do is if you 
do want to support this campaign, if you do want to see change within our great union, then I'm asking you to sign up um, to be a supporter of this campaign. And when you sign up, it's not just, it's not like you join a gym and you don't do anything and then you don't get a benefit from that gym. You get the best benefit from the gym as you do from a trade union when you join it and then when you take an active role, when you get involved. And that's what I'm asking people to do. If you want to see real change, don't just leave it for somebody else to do. The great lesson of politics in recent times comes from the man who's just been interviewing me is that when people stand up and organize and get involved we we can create a real energy we can create some real hope and we can really move things we can shift the paradigm of politics in this country and i firmly believe we can shift the paradigm of the trade union movement so get involved in the campaign vote for me to be the next general secretary of unison but also ask other people to vote for me to be the next general secretary ask other people to get involved in the campaign ask other people just to stand up for their workmates to stand up for each other because when we do that the lesson of history tells us this when we stand up together as working class people you know what a powerful force that is for change and i firmly believe that the best years of the trade union movement are ahead of us, not behind us. The best years of the trade union movement are ahead of us. And it all comes down to all of us standing together in solidarity, standing up for each other, because when we do that, we've got a real chance of making a real difference to people who really are lacking hope at the moment. Roger, thank you. We is so much more powerful than I. Absolutely. You bring hope. Let's go into this with hope. Hope that you win, but hope also for all of the people that are in the union, because we've got big battles ahead, that we all know, but we have to be united to win those battles, to bring about real justice for the people who've been so grievously badly treated in our society. Roger, thank you very much for this interview today and thank you very much for all the work you've done and will do in our great union. Thank you. Jeremy, thank you for all you do. 100% support as always. Thank you.